And I find that really inspiring how our preparation from death can be our liberation here and now. Right, the opportunity of us preparing so that we can have a awareness in our dying process can help us have an awareness in our life. And it's really a beautiful opportunity. And I wanted to read a little, um, this is a, not the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is that kind of more um, direct text, but this is a, a kind of secondary commentary on the Tibetan Book of the Dead by Sogyal Rinpoche, who um, unfortunately, had a lot of missteps as a teacher, and he did not hold his samaya or ethics. And these words are really beautiful. So I kind of caveat uh, this, you know, very flawed human who brought a lot of very beautiful understandings. And this book, the Tibetan book of living and dying, is really intended for people um, who are preparing to be with others who are dying, as well as for your own death. And he has a couple passages I wanted to read to us me, and have us think about this uh, towards our meditation. So part of the first 300 pages of, <laughs> of this book is really all the phases and stages of the body and the mind and, and their dissolution. And he says, as I've explained in death, all the components of our body and mind are stripped away and disintegrate. As the body dies, the senses and subtle elements dissolve. And this is followed by death of the ordinary aspect of our mind, with all of its negative emotions of anger, desire, and ignorance. Finally, nothing remains to obscure our true nature, as everything that in life has clouded the enlightened, enlightened mind has fallen away. And what is revealed is the primordial ground of our absolute nature, which is like a pure and cloudless sky. Not how we usually think about our process of dying, right? A stripping away towards a more essential aspect of who we are. We don't need to wait until we die to practice it. But I find it really inspiring that there is this opportunity for these various layers of our mind to loosen at the time of death, uh, for there to be instead of, you know, we imagine dying and we imagine it to be terrifying, sad, horrible. And yet, you know, as we see from um, many accounts of people who are dying on some sort of spiritual path, there can be a profound ease, this primordial nature of mind. Um, so this, so he says, um, the pure and cloudless guy, this is called the dawning of the ground luminosity or clear light where consciousness itself dissolves into all the encompassing space of truth. The Tibetan Book of the Dead says, the nature of everything is open and naked like the sky. Luminous emptiness without center or circumference, the pure naked Rigpa. So Rigpa is the name for clear light. Primordial consciousness dawns. So it's just this idea that that is, you know, that is our true nature. And yet we get caught up with the ignorance, the greed, the mind of hope and fear. So it was, it struck me as I was thinking about this idea of how we orient towards death. We feel like death is, you know, a more constricted, difficult way of being <laughs> in this world. It's the end for sure, but we don't think about it as liberation and we don't think about life as actually that constricted kind of place of being bound, right? And um, he has a couple other things here. He says, why is it that this state is called luminosity or clear light? There's different ways of explaining this. Some say it expresses the radiant clarity of the nature of mind. It's total freedom from darkness or obscuration free from unknowing and endowed with the ability to cognize. Another master describes the luminosity or clear light as a state of minimum distraction. All our senses and sense objects are dissolved. What is important is not to confuse it with light, physical light that we know, or experiences of light that unfold. So in some of the descriptions of how dying occurs, there's a series of different colored lights. So anyone who's read the Tibetan Book of Dying, so not to be confused with those lights. 
But this is the natural radiance, the wisdom of our own Rigpa, the uncompounded nature present throughout all of samsara and nirvana. Only if we have really been introduced to the nature of mind or Rigpa, and only if we have established and stabilized it through meditation and integrated it into our life, does the moment of death offer real opportunity for liberation. Even though the ground luminosity presents its natural itself naturally to us, most of us are totally unprepared for the sheer immensity, the vast and subtle death of its naked simplicity. Though all of our confusion dies in death, instead of surrendering and opening to the luminosity, in our fear and ignorance, we may withdraw and instinctively hold on to our grasping. So I just thought it was really an interesting framing of what is it that allows us to um, essentially prepare to die well, is also what prepares us to live well in this moment. And so in a meditation that I'd love us to do together, I'd like us to try and kind of find that clear light luminosity. I know that's so obscure and the words are, are not the feeling, but the idea is can we practice and meditate on stripping away everything that's in between us and that true nature? In order for us to do it, I kind of have to convince you that that is your true nature. <laughs> and I know it might seem like your true nature is rumination, frustration, anxiety, right? And absolutely, if we're living in the present, I'm sorry, if we're living in the future or the past, it can feel like that. But in this moment, the clear light is more available that sense of luminosity is more available. Does anyone, I know, again, it's a funny set of words, but has anyone experienced that feeling of such deep openness? Forget light. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone have, and I really want you to be honest, be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, great. Thank you for your honesty, Shane. I appreciate it. Yeah. And so I think one way to consider it, it's not a thought. It's not a feeling in the body. It's a bit of a sense of, you know, there's a funny analogy I, I love on like opening the mind, which is you have a very a tight bale of hay and you cut the cord. I just all these different kind of metaphors that try to help us with that, you know, you could say oceanic or open way of experiencing the mind, heart, body at the same time. And I think, you know, many of us feel it in glimpses that we don't quite recognize. Just these like in between moments that can feel so easeful. The real nuance to it is it's not just being relaxed. I'm totally into relaxation, but this is different. This is like, there's like a brightness to it and not bright as in light, but a sense of clarity and presence. Way more descriptive. Are you convinced yet? <laughs> I mean, also part of it, like part of, you know, like trusting or exploring our clear light is a belief that there is part of each and every one of us that's fundamentally already good. That might be a harder sell, anybody? Right, like part of us, not, not like everything we've done in the past, not every way that we show up. I mean, I got really grumpy today, for example, like that's not my true nature. But we can see that there is that potential goodness in each of us, right? Do we kind of believe that? Mm -hmm. And there's a real deep relationship between clear light and our basic goodness. Not I'm good because I did this thing well, or I'm good because I'm a good friend, but this real basic goodness, right? That's, again, it's also in trees and in waterfalls. And, it, you know, it's not so unique, but there is a basic goodness. And that when we connect with that basic goodness in a sense of openness, 
there's that clear light feeling. So that's, yes. Well, the way someone, and I wish I could uh, credit them who it was, explained it to me was, if we did not have inherent goodness, we would not be pursuing more goodness. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, and then, oh, you recommended that book like months ago. And just for anybody who's looking for something. Oh, I don't know. Anybody need an alternative to listening to the news? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's an abridged reading of it on YouTube. Which one? The Tibetan. Oh, book. nice. Yeah. 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 It is. It is quite a good book. Um yeah, so what I'm hoping for us to do in this practice, uh, as we did last week, which is noticing the difference between contraction and expansion. So this is, I think, such a fundamental tool of training the mind. So noticing focused attention right on our breath and then that kind of spacious openness. But what I'm going to invite us to do, and I want us to be careful with this, is to, in some ways, like bring forth what is that gripping fear of loss that really occludes our ability to be open. Familiar with that feeling? It can be helpful to think of a specific thing, per se, right? Like, I think of my beloved kitty, you know, and one day, and probably before me, that kitty will go. And there's like a, whoa, like there is a feeling just saying it. It comes into the body and the mind. In the practice, it's really important to not continue to think about that. Then you're just practicing a panic attack, right? <clears throat> so contract, we're not going to do that, right? But we want to bring, we want to bring to mind just that sense of like, here's what's in the way. And then imagine like, I am going to strip it down. I'm going to let it go. Like as though we were gripping it, we release it in the mind and allow ourselves that opportunity to explore clear light. Okay. It's pretty exciting. So instead of imagining ourselves as corpses, this is like, this is an upgrade, right? We're going to just kind of touch into a little bit of that sense of fear and find ourselves hopefully touching into clear light would like to move or adjust in any way, please feel free. Yeah. Let's begin by really finding ourselves fully inhabiting the body, bringing our attention and awareness from the crown through the face, the chest, the back, all the way down through the buttocks, the legs, and the soles of the feet. Whenever our attention and awareness is here in the body, we're in the present moment. The body is always in the present moment. So for a couple more breaths, just really having the sense of fully inhabiting the body from the crown all the way to the soles of the feet.
taking one more step in the body, noticing the layers of whatever else is present beyond the form body. This could be a layer or residue of heartbreak or fatigue. This could be a layer or residue of joy, confusion. See if you can notice through the body what else is being carried in this moment. And with the next breath, you can inhale, fully feeling whatever is being carried in the body. And then with an open mouth, exhale and release whatever doesn't need to be here in this moment. I'm doing this a couple more times together, inhaling in and feeling whatever is being carried. And then exhale, release. One more time. Taking a moment to feel the presence of place. Imagining or feeling the sense of the sky above us and the stars. Here in the Dharma Collective, feeling a sense of the vibrancy of the street outside. And the many beings who are surrounding us on their way home, on their way out, just the natural movement of life. And for a couple more breaths, really feeling a sense that being in the body is our homecoming. After a long day, we get to come home and be in the body. And whatever is here, we can be curious and kind. We're recognizing that sense of stable support presence in the body.
it's okay if the mind feels like a wild stallion racing around here and there. We can always return, relax, and refresh ourselves right back in the body. Now focusing a bit more on the breath to give us a single place. So noticing the breath, especially noticing the breath at the belly. Breathing in, dwelling in the present moment of the breath. And breathing out, knowing this is a wonderful moment. As we're simply breathing and following the breath. Of course, getting distracted and returning. Can you notice if there is something that's already present that feels okay? This can be sometimes hard to locate underneath the worries of the day. But be, be curious and investigate, is there something that is already feels okay, just as an intrinsic part of your being? This is sometimes described as the natural gold of your heart in which we just gently dust off the dirt that accumulates through fear and anger, aversion and desire. I'm taking a moment and seeing if we can feel and sense that inner gold.
without totally uprooting from whatever sense of goodness we might touch into. We will shift our practice a bit to this bringing forth, this remembering or imagining of a feeling of fear of loss. All of us, of course, have experienced loss. It is part of the natural course of life. And allowing a bit, just using a bit of the poison as medicine to bring forth this feeling of fear of loss that may keep us bound up. Again, this could be the fear of losing someone we love, our beloved. The fear of losing physical abilities or mental capacities. Fear of losing work or resources and finances. See if you can choose one and really get a hit of that feeling in the chest and the face and the belly. Feeling the contraction. And with the fists kind of clenching them to mirror that contraction that holding fear can create. So holding the fists and feeling that sense of contraction. Maybe we feel it in the jaw or the brows. And with our next inhale, we tighten just a little bit more and then exhale, completely release. Completely release. Keep releasing, keep releasing, keep releasing. Almost as though that fear was like a cloak and it was cast off to the side. Feeling a sense now of awareness and the space of awareness. We can have awareness of our hands, which are no longer clenching. We can also have awareness of our thoughts arising and passing away. And awareness of sounds coming and going. Each of these are like waves in the ocean. In the greater ocean is our sense of clear light awareness. To experience clear light doesn't mean there are no waves. That means recognizing that the ocean is where the waves come from. And relaxing, leaning back into that sense, clear light, the ground of luminosity, complete openness. Mm. If it were truly the last times we were breathing together and meditating together, 
we would want to cast aside and strip away anything between us and our pure naked awareness. Feeling that kind of resolve to more fully inhabit a spacious awareness of the mind body. We can keep a light focus on the breath. <clears throat> As we continue to allow a sense of expansion and openness. Whenever you get distracted, relax and completely release. And if you start feeling dull or spaced out, you can invite that sense of uprightness through the spine. Or for a couple breaths, focus on the inhale and the vividness of inhaling. Our openness and vividness and ability to feel that sense of spaciousness can be supported by considering this. Maybe everything is already okay, just as it is. Relax and open into the energy of that deep knowing of our okayness. As long as there is vividness, you can keep going. Keep letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go and finding maybe a sense of ease and joy.
A couple more moments here. Again, the invitation is to feel and reveal this natural state of our mind, not contrived, but exists when we strip away everything else. Very gently coming back to the breath and the body. Feeling the warmth of your hands. The sense of the ground beneath you. Thank you for your practice. Questions, reflections. Everybody feel that fear? No? Isn't it funny, like right when we need it? <laughs> yeah. No, it can be it can be a bit shy. Yeah. So going back to your opening question, Melissa and I got the opportunity to be out in um Calaveras um, State National oh, State Park, yeah. Big Tree Park, yeah, and we did about five, four miles, five miles, but it took us four hours, and it's because you know your the big sequoia trees are there, and so we're just like in awe, but it's a good reflection on how you know our time here mm -hmm. is just compared to these trees. These trees are there for some of them thousands of years. And it was just nice to be walking through this, um, you know, through these woods that everywhere you look, there's life and death going on mm. all at the same time. And as beautiful as these trees are, um, you know, it's sad when you see one come down, but when one comes down, new there's opportunity for new sunlight and, you know, new life to come up there. So, um, yeah, it was it was a very nice, somewhat meditative walk, mm. which kept reminding me of impermanence, right? right? And also that compared to some other beings on this planet, our time here is very um, limited. Yeah, you know, and so to to take the time to appreciate what you know the time that we do have here and 
and for me it was just nice to just even put my hands on these trees and just imagine like what they've seen or heard you know and what they've experienced in in um, the time that they've been in this um this place so, yeah yeah thank you thank you yeah <clears throat> and it is you know i love that you pointed that out some of our our fears right that we kind of are often operating in the background or maybe in the foreground our fears about loss right it's not seeing clearly the nature of reality so buddha and especially in this chapter that we're going to get into and he's throughout the book, you know, the path of awakening is the, you know, the cessation of birth and death. And you're like, what? You know, people are still being born and dying, but it's the cessation of our fixation that dead death is bad. <clears throat> I'm going to think about how bad it is all the time. Like it's that it's the death of that fixation that keeps us so bound up. And um, it is, you know, I think, being around be, like these old trees or rocks or, you know, beings who've been around so much longer than us, very humbling. It can be a really nice place to practice, you know, kind of, and the forest in a way is like a charnel ground, right? It is like a place of death, um, but also a renewal. So, yeah, thank you. Any other Thoughts, questions, clear light reflections. Yeah. Um, I just really, the most profound piece was that kind of thinking about this right now sort of being enough or being okay as it is. And mm -hmm. I think for me, a big, I may be embarrassed to admit how big of a motivator it is on a daily basis is that things are not okay right now. But if I sort of do these things, I will get to that place yeah. where things are okay. Yeah. And I think there's also kind of a uh, assumption, there's sort of a forgetting of impermanence in that, that like, yeah, I'll have time in the future when things will be okay. And I'll get to that spot if I just do enough of these tasks. And I appreciate the like, things kind of I need to be okay with things now because things you know I I don't know how how much longer I have yeah and there isn't some future state where if I do enough things on my to-do list then I'll I'll be relaxed yes beautiful yeah. insight yeah and I, I think that is the kind of if then mindset right if I get this that or the other then I'll be okay and it is, that's like, you know, that could be a shorthand definition of samsara, right? Of just keeping us bound to the next. And we're kind of onto ourselves. Like we know that that to-do list is endless and doesn't actually lead towards the relaxation and release that we see. But it's so compelling, you know, there's such a kind of momentum with it. And that's why it's it's so interesting, you know, when you read, especially about these transitions towards death, that even as you're dying, you're like, no, no, no. Like there's, I gotta do some stuff, right? Like there's some things and and the fear, right? Like that holding on. And so to be able to practice that here and now, that's the amazing mm, opportunity for us to, sometimes it's said in the traditions to die before you die, right? To die into this normal conventional way of being, in, which is the mind of hope and fear. Like, I really hope this happens. Like, God, I hope that doesn't happen over and over and over and over and over. Right. Like that's gotta, that is not a life, right. That's kind of being bound. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And how about clear light? Was there any, I know it's abstract. Yeah, that was, that was challenging. I think that was, that felt less accessible, um, especially as I'm sort of in that task mindset and, this is, you know, my mind is still kind of racing on work and things like that. Yeah. And so the that other piece about sort of this being okay or not, I would sort of yeah. <clears throat> do enough things to get out of this was what was most successful. Yeah. And did that create a feeling of ease in the moment or yeah, I think so. I think because it, it did feel compelling like this, I sort of Bought it. like I, I believe like yeah this this probably is enough and if there are things I might do to sort of make changes in my life but also this is 
okay as it is mm. in, a, in a kind of more profound way. Yeah. Uh, that was really, that I just lowers the stakes and kind of takes the anxiety level down. That was Wonderful. Yeah. And I think how, you know, spacious openness awareness, pure awareness, clear light, rigpa, primordial awareness, however, all of these terms feel. It could be unique. It's again all these different terms. It might just be huge relief, right? And because again, I do think openness as the quality and knowing we know what contractions like. We feel the openness and like practicing openness. And the purpose of practicing openness, it really helps us move through the contractions, move through, move. We have to actually practice openness. And so much meditation, we're practicing focused attention, which is absolute prerequisite for almost every practice we want to do, but practicing the openness too. So yeah, thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about El Dia de los Muertos mm. in Mexico. And uh, 30 years ago, it's when I met Gina. <laughs> and we went the first thing to the Panteón Dolores, which is a Catholic uh, Panteón. Mm. And it was the Dia de los Muertos, so it was full of flowers and people with so much food and enjoying and tequila mm. and everything. I couldn't understand <laughs> why they were enjoying so much. But then when I went out and for years and years and years, I cannot forget that even if you go to the cemetery mm. and bury your people, there can be happiness. I don't know how, but uh, I saw it. So uh, every time that I go to the Jewish cemetery, I say, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to be like, oh, my mom and my dad. No, I'm going to say, well, that's good. <laughs> Everything is good. It's going to be good. And uh, I think life, if you accept the beginning and the ending, mm. you're going to live much better. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that is, um, that is what the Buddha is talking about when he says it's the end, right? It's actually the end of birth and death through that clear seeing of life as it is. Um, um, if you have time to, oh, oh yes, I think we have, some hands that will raise Claudia. Yes. Hi, Claudia. How are you? How are you doing? Good. Good. Well, I have some um, reflections on on the practice right now, yeah. but also um, on uh, the Dharma of last week, and also some of uh, the insights that I got uh, while practicing the four remembrances after last week. Um, I just want to say today it was very helpful when you said, you know, besides feeling our physical bodies, like the residues of the day or whatever. And uh, I had a little bit of anger and sadness and fatigue. And I felt all of that in my body. But then, you know, it was so great when you said, let go, let go, let go. And I did. And uh, it was like, there's no point in, in regretting past things or whatever. You know, it's like, it's done and there's nothing you can do about it. And it's the here and now. And so mm. that was that was very helpful. I mm. couldn't quite reach the clear light. Other times when I've done some other meditations, I felt that expansiveness and that absolute emptiness that is so full. I don't know how to explain. Yes. Real openness, this, this, this incredible, I mean, I'm conscious, but I, but but there's there's no time. There's no, hmm. anyway, yes. it's like being cool. in the universe or something. I don't know, I don't know how to explain. So <laughs> I felt that and it's, it's been wonderful. Um, in terms of, um, uh, the Dharma last week, when you were talking about uh, Buddha's 
senior disciple and how sick and how much in pain he was. And, uh, and then when he died, the Buddha said, now he's liberated. Now he's free of delusions and, and all of that. And, you know, oftentimes I dedicate my practice to refugees all over the world and people in war. And I always, uh, you know, pray or whatever you want to say for, for them to be shelter and fed and safe. But the last thing I said, and maybe you be liberated. Yeah. And what and whatever in whatever form I feel like even um whether alive or dead. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking about like my mother right now, 93 year old, she's in chronic pain. And uh she would we talk about these things and she would very much feel liberated. Not that she's uh, I mean, she's telling me many times I'm not going to commit suicide or she's, you know, she's Catholic. She's not going to ask for like, uh, what do you call that? Assisted dying, okay, death, should... whatever. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but it would be a liberation to die really, hmm. um, you know, just not to be in pain so much anymore. Yeah. And the, and the inklings, I'm sorry to be so long, but it's just that I wanted to say from, from the four remembrances is that I thought about the grasping you know, to material to material things, my home, I love jewelry, <laughs> whatever. And then um, thinking about like impermanence, and you know, I'm just here. This is just temporary. This is my house right now, but in a way, it's not because mm-hmm. when I die, that's it. You know. Yeah. So why really cling to it? And I actually started doing some cleaning in my house and getting rid of things. So it's just mm. been very, very rich. And um, mm. so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, beautiful. I, and I do think that like loosening of attachments, I mean, it's, again, you really look behind a lot of this and you find fear, right? And so mm-hmm. that is why it's so useful to practice with fear and you don't need to do it during meditation because fear <laughs> is with us all the time. So right when we notice the fear, can we just openness? And, you know, we did this practice, you know, building up and then resting in clear light and resting and resting, but you can just do it for a moment. Sometimes it's easier to feel that sense of total spaciousness and openness for just a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and to do that, especially, you know, it's, it's so hard though, when we're caught up, when I was in my grumpy mood earlier, I said to myself, you're dreaming, you're not awake. Cause like I, I knew I was like projecting and uh, uh, um, didn't cut through. I had to use the, um, the great spiritual tool of listening to a different song. Sometimes like putting on music, you know, it's just like, Ooh, and then I was like out done. And I was like, Oh my, Whoa, that was that. Right. So however we can make space, ideally, like we can just feel that openness, but we might need some other tools. Um, yeah. And I, and I do think, you know, the reflections on being with the dead and rejoicing with the dead, it, that's not really quite in this chapter, but it is, I do think, um, such a great way for us to understand impermanence is to really recognize the passage of time and the passage of those who we love and, and not let it feel quite so, tight with so much fear around it not that we don't love we love and we miss they don't come back like we miss them right and but that kind of fear that can calcify around it that's what we really want to look at and work with um so this chapter might take us a minute so rich it is so beautiful it's so again you know we're in the kind of um buddha's really kind of mature phase and stage of teaching and these practices just start getting woven together even more deeply they're not new but he's revealing them in new ways we are in chapter 65 65 chapters wow and um so this is when ananda who's uh, both buddha's cousin but also he has a probably a photographic memory so he's the one who's close to the buddha and always remembering all the teachings 
Um, and he was asked by a number, a number of monks to ask Buddha some questions in front of everybody so everyone could hear the answer. And he said, Buddha, what is meant by the world and the dharmas? I was like, that is a practical question, <laughs> right? These words and terms that he's always using. And the Buddha said, Ananda, the world is the collection, is the collective whole of all things subject to change and dissolution. So everything, right? All dharmas are contained in the 18 realms, the six sense organs, the six sense objects, and the six sense consciousnesses. Essentially, how not only we experience the world through our senses, but as we remember from earlier teachings and the kind of 12 links, how we respond, right? So it's not just the sound of, I think it was like a UPS guy on the street. I don't know if anyone noticed that, like clack, 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 uh, of the sound of a um, the back of a truck coming up, but also, hmm, who's delivering stuff this late and where are they, right? That's like the whole aspect of our senses and sense consciousness. And then he says, there are no dharmas apart from these 18 realms. All 18 realms are subject to birth, death, to change, and dissolution. That is why I've said that the world is the collective whole of all things which possess the nature of change and dissolution. Ananda then asked, you have often, often said that all dharmas are empty. What is meant by that? I have said all dharmas are empty because all dharmas are without a separate self. None of the six sense organs, objects, or consciousness possess an individual separate self. I mean, the Buddha has said this so many times, right? This separate self is just, it's kind of the very root of our difficulty in understanding the nature of reality as it is. And he really unpacks it here. But this idea of, you know, um, what I hear, what I think, what I see as uniquely mine, such a big problem for us. We don't recognize the connection of absolutely everything. Whatever it is I think I hear, right, is conditioned by my own past experiences, whatever is going on out there. And it's just this like this separate self, that term, it really is, it's such a, we can feel that sense of a separate self, right? And I think when we're fear, fearful or when we're angry, we feel even more of that separate self. Again, it feels like contraction, right? Separate self is not open, <laughs> not spacious, really contracted. And it has this real sense of being, um, you know, through everything we're feeling, sensing, seeing, thinking, you know, that we know what's true, that our version of reality is what's happening. So the Buddha says, um, do, 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 do. Oh, and then Ananda says, you have said that the three gates of liberation are emptiness, signlessness, and aimlessness. You have said that all dharmas are empty. Is it because all dharmas are subject to change that they're also empty? And he said, I've spoken about emptiness and the contemplation on emptiness. The contemplation on emptiness is a wondrous meditation. It can help people transcend suffering birth and death. Today I'll speak more on this contemplation. We are sitting together in this Dharma hall. There are no markets, buffaloes, or villages inside the Dharma hall. There are only bhikkhus sitting and listening to the Dharma. We can say that the hall is empty of all that is not here, and that it contains what is actually here. The Dharma hall is empty of markets, buffaloes, and villages, but contain bhikkhus. Do you agree? Ananda says, yes. And after the Dharma talk, we will leave the Dharma hall and there will be no longer any bhikkhus here. Bhikkhus means monks. At that moment, the Dharma hall will be empty of markets, buffaloes, villages, and bhikkhus. <laughs> Do you agree? Yes. He's doing his Socratic method here. Ananda, full always means full of something. And empty always means empty of something. The words full and empty have no meaning on their own. That is pretty great. It's really helpful, right? Because we're thinking of emptiness as kind of this thing, right? And maybe fullness as a thing. And so this, it's a context, our emptiness in context. 
And he says, please explain more. And he says, consider this, empty is always empty of something, such as markets, buffaloes, villages, and bhikkhus. We cannot say that emptiness is something that exists independently. And fullness is the same. Fullness is not something that exists independently. Mm -hmm. As for the dharmas, if we say that all dharmas are full, what are they full of? And if we say that all dharmas are empty, what are they empty of? The emptiness of all dharmas refers to the fact that all dharmas are empty of a permanent and unchanging self. That is the meaning of the emptiness of all dharmas. And then... <laughs> A permanent and unchanging nature would be an essential self. Contemplating in order to see the absence of an independent, separate self is contemplating on emptiness. So whenever we are doing a practice in meditation in which we notice that, you know, a sound arises and passes away, that a thought comes and goes, it's a meditation on emptiness, right? Emptiness always has such a kind of heavy connotation, like this, this really difficult term to understand in Buddhism. But here he's laying it out so clearly. Emptiness is just that everything is changing. Nothing is permanent. And he says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is, he does another really wonderful analogy here. He points to the bowl and says to Ananda, would you say this bowl is full or empty? And he says, it's full of water. Ananda takes a bowl outside and empty all the water. Ananda does this and he returns and places the empty bowl on the table. The Buddha lifted the bowl and turned it upside down. Ananda, is this bowl now full or empty? It is no longer full, it is empty. Ananda, are you sure the bowl is empty? I'm sure the bowl is empty. <laughs> this bowl is no longer full of water, but it's full of air. You have forgotten already. Empty means empty of something, and full means full of something. In this case, the bowl is empty of water, but full of air. The bowl can be empty or full. Of course, where there's emptiness, fullness depends on the presence of the bowl. Without the bowl, there is no emptiness or fullness, just like the Dharma hole. In order for it to be full or empty, it must be there. And apparently... That gave a big, ah, all the bhikkhus suddenly exclaimed in their understanding. Don't get caught by words. If the dharma are phenomena empty of self, their existence is not the existence of ordinary perception. Their existence has the same meaning as emptiness. When we, spoke in, when we speak about an empty and a full bowl, we're talking also about an empty and a full dharma hall. Although we have agreed that the bowl on the table is empty of water, if we look deeply, we see it's not entirely true. Among the interwoven elements that have given, risen, given rise to this bowl, do you see water? Yes, without water, the potter would not have been able to mix the clay and fashion the bowl. Just so, looking deeply, we can see the presence of water in the bowl, even though we stated it was empty of water. The presence of the bowl depends on water. Can you see the fire element in the bowl? I see the air, an element in the bowl. Without the air, it could not have burned. Uh, the fire could not have burned, and the potter would not have could not have lived. I see the potter and his skillful hands. I see his consciousness. I see his kiln and the wood stacked in the kiln. I see the trees where the wood came from. I see the rain, the sun, and the earth, which enabled the trees to grow. I can see a thousand of interpenetrating inter elements which give rise to this bowl. So just this idea that any single thing we look into has all the emptiness and all the fullness of all dharmas of all time. And that's really the kind of mind-blowing piece. It's a little almost simplistic, but it's actually kind of hard to live with that kind of awareness, that everything is empty and full at the same time. Um, he says, contemplating the law of dependent co-arising, which is a demonstration of all the elements here, we see the bowl cannot exist independently. It only exists in interdependent 
an interdependent relation with all other dharmas. All dharmas depend on each other for birth, existence, and death. The presence of one dharma implies the presence of all other dharmas. The presence of all dharmas is implied by the presence of just one. This is the, pin this is the principle of interpenetration and interbeing. And then he goes one step further, and he says, actually, at present, there are no markets, buffaloes, or villages in the Dharma Hall. But from one viewpoint, in reality, without the presence of markets and buffaloes and villages, this Dharma Hall couldn't exist. You see, we should be able to see the presence of markets, buffaloes, and villages. Without this, that is not. This is the basic meaning of emptiness. This is because that is. It's like the simplest definition of emptiness I've ever heard. This is because that is. Okay. Thoughts, objections. Why would it be important to meditate so deeply on that one phrase? This is because that is. Yes. Because it shows the interdependence of everything. Yes. And if we see the interdependence of everything, then what? Then it's easier to get that expansive view. Yeah. When I was younger, we used to call it being everywhere in general and nowhere in particular. Mm. That sense of, of awe. Yeah. Because right. of the interdependence of everything. Yeah. And how even that brass bowl contains all of those elements yeah. that were discussed in the reading. And you get that fine about it. At first, it can be terrifying. Mm -hmm. After a while, you get used to looking at things that way. Yeah. And it's delightful when you're reminded of that. It's a big relief. It's a big relief. It It is the end of suffering, especially if suffering is anger and fear and attachment and aversion. Right, Mace? Okay, no problem. You're absolutely permitted. Because, you know, when we really recognize that interpenetration of interbeing, so like everything connected, I mean, I couldn't do it today, but my grumpy, new, my grumpy mood was such a delusion. Like there's me and someone else and that's like fixed. Like it's ridiculous, you know? And so it is zooming out and taking perspective. We can't have this view of emptiness be wholesome and healthy unless we are steeped in the values and ethics of why. So this view actually could be harmful if we didn't know that our ultimate purpose was to be of service to all beings. So there is like a subtle, because this view is like, you know, in contemporary times, it's a quantum view, right? All places, all times, and you know, all universes. It's interesting, quantum physics and Buddhism have a lot of overlaps. You see all these conferences on quantum physics and Buddhism, actually more in... Um, Southeast Asia than here, but just this idea of recognizing the profound complexity and the liberation of that. Yeah. Yes. I um, have so many thoughts. Right? So I've, I've been granted a body that's not always easiest to be in. Uh, in fact, I might be slightly coherent today for several reasons, but I remember after a long time, I was feeling particularly bummed out about it. And this spot experiment well not okay, but bummed about this body. Let's let's contemplate like what's the boundary of the body? Hmm. I bummed it out. Yeah. So I thought I would go right to the end and I was like, oh, what if this body was in a vacuum? Just like floating in space. I'd be like, well I'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> it would have uh, functioned. Yeah. Like we have to add some air back in. 
It's not enough. Water, it's nourishment. Where does the nourishment come from? It's warm. So my apartment keeps me warm. All right, so the apartment part of the body. <laughs> anyway, this kept going for a while. And afterwards, I felt a lot better. Hmm. A lot more supportive. I was like, okay, so I'm bummed about the, this, this thing here, but like, there's actually a lot of other stuff. Yeah. That's uh, interrelated. But... Hmm. I love that. Thank you for sharing. And in, in case folks online didn't hear it, it's like a contemplation on when the body doesn't show up in the way we always want or isn't functioning how we like. And it can be easy to feel in some ways almost like alienated by the body, you know? And um, then Raph was describing how he used that as an opportunity to recognize everything at play in this living body. Right. Every all the elements needed for this body to be supported and cared for. And that helped feel more grounded, and more present. Yeah, it is. It is. It is a little bit paradoxical that by recognizing the quantum complexity, we can feel more grounded, possibly. Um, yeah. And I he gets um, and I just love this idea, like all of them, everything of all time is always already here. <laughs> I mean, the buffaloes and the markets are right here, whether or not it's an interesting, um, I find it really comforting, you know, the sense of everything being connected. Um, so then he goes on to say, <clears throat> and by the way, the bhikkhus were listening in perfect silence. So he says, without this, that is not the basic meaning of emptiness. This is because that is. The Buddha's word made a deep impression on them. And after a, a brief pause, he lifted the empty bowl again and said, this bowl cannot exist independently. It is here thanks to all the things we consider non-bowl entities, such as earth and water and fire, air and potter and so forth. It is the same for all dharmas. All dharmas exist interdependent relation to all others. Look deeply at this bowl and you can see the entire universe. <laughs> this bowl contains the entire universe. There's only one thing the bowl is empty of, and that is a separate individual self. What is a separate individual self? It is a self that exists completely on its own, independent of all other elements. No dharma can exist independently from others. No, one, no dharma can possess a separate essential self. Empty means empty of self. So again, it's uh, so often misunderstood, this idea of selflessness in Buddhism, you know, that there's no you, but it's not that there is no aspect or essence or kind of basic nature of you, just that it isn't fixed. It's not at all separate from everything else that's connected with you. <laughs> Which I think is, yeah, it's like a very beautiful way of understanding. Even, you know, in, in some of the contemplative science worlds, the models of the mind that have been created to study the mind is this inactive model where what we think and feel is a relationship to how the world actually is responding to us, not just how we're responding to the world. Recognizing there's a dynamic interplay in everything that's happening. So we are, you know, like our, our consciousness is informed by the trees that we are around, the people that we are around, the books, the music, the weather, right? I mean, it's all obvious, but to have that kind of chorusness of a sense of self, it is, it is liberating. Yeah? What do you think? Sometimes it can be a little confusing using but i find that it also you know again today i needed music to get me out of the grump but that kind of like remembering impermanence as an intervention usually can sound very morbid like whoa i'm just gonna remember impermanence but it's remembering the kind of interpenetration also of everything the connection and the always changing nature um Yes, yeah, so I'm going to leave it with that for today. Any other thoughts or questions? I know 
I know it's like a it's it's a bit abstract and it can feel why bring in these theoretical ideas why not just meditate practice it directly it really informs our meditation to have this kind of sense or this feeling and even if the words just take a moment of like hmm emptiness is empty of separate self hmm there is no separate self like starting to feel what that's like in our interactions with others in our daily activities yeah, just like what Tom was saying in the beginning of slowing down while walking. I think these ideas are not meant to be really impressive, cool things that we can write on a postcard and tack on our wall, but how we shift and change our behaviors, you know, our interactions with the world, because it really will. Like these ideas really do permeate our perception of the world, how we meet it. And the opportunity is to meet it with this, yeah, more openness, more porousness. So that's my hope for you all. Um, let's, yeah, please. Oh, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know, like, uh, but, um, I've heard, like, some um, teachers, maybe they're more new age to kind of talk about, like, and they do like a lot of like hand wavy like quantum physics connected to meditation, um, kind of bringing on some sort of like material manifestation mm. of like stuff that you might want. I mean, stuff mostly kind of being emphasized. Um, I don't know if you like. How do you sort of? Maybe I'm just being like kind of cynical, but I don't know. That seems to be a thing. I, I don't. Yeah, no, there is, you know. And, and sometimes when people talk about, it, like, you know, the quantum nature of reality and then aligning it with sort of, like, uh, I guess, scoff. And I don't know. Maybe I'm sure you're right. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, two chapters ago, it's all about all the different little um, groups of religious practitioners in the time of the Buddha, right? And they're all, I mean, I think his his major cutting through on that is don't believe anything you can't experience. You know, don't believe anything that you can't experience, right? So I say clear light, if you're not experiencing it, it's not real. But if you get that hit, it'd be like, oh, damn, that's what you was talking about, right? And it becomes real. And so I do think, and it's so interesting, we'll get to this later, but the Buddha, people always wanted to ask him these intense metaphysical questions about the nature of birth and death and whether there's ghosts, like just all, and like how many, I don't think they said planets, because I don't even realize they were on a planet at that time, but you know, all these questions about like the bigger nature of the universe, and he would be silent and, you know, frustrated the hell out of people and he's like there's no purpose in those conversations for your waking up if there were i would talk about it it's a distraction so i i you know i like woo woo series and or um it can be a distraction and i think especially that pray for stuff to make it happen here can be really encouraging, like Oprah's The Secret, right? <laughs> if you want it, it'll find you, like put good vibes and it magnetizes you. It's not really a harm, but I do think it can, the harm can happen if it's distracting us away from the work of training this mind, this insane monkey mind. Like we have to train it every day in order for it to be serviceable so we can see clearly we can be kind, maintain that openness. So anything that distracts us away from that can be problematic. And then I do think if we want like a pill or like a magic spell or, you know what I mean? It's, it's going to be disappointing over time. Um, so I share your cynicism. But uh, it is, and I do think quantum physics, like any any good quantum physicist who is honest will say, wow, we so much we don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a theory, right? Fascinating. It's beautiful, actually, and it's um, what I understand of it. But uh, yeah, and often very materialist, you know, not necessarily a view of like a spiritual, um, a life. Alan Wallace has an amazing dialogue on city arts and lecture with, um, 
a physicist, I can't remember his name, where they just go at it. I'll look for the link and bring it. And, you know, Alan's like, you really don't know the limits of mind and brain. And he's like, the only thing that exists is the material world. And anywho, so there's some good stuff. So, okay, let's dedicate our merit because that is exactly what we're here for. <clears throat> so bringing back our attention and awareness to the breath and the body. I'm really feeling a sense of welcoming for whatever is here. And as this gift to ourself, a sense of loving and supporting whatever is here. And bringing hands together at the heart, symbolically considering that we could transfer, radiate, extend and expand all of the goodness, all of the care, all of the interest and love that we bring here together tonight so that each and every being could be healthy and strong. Each and every being could be free from suffering and no peace. That each and every being could be liberated. Thanks all. Appreciate your openness to treading towards light and death. You know, look forward to seeing those who can join tomorrow, just down the street, Petro del Sol. And Mace, I bet there's some announcements. Also, yes, please, we need your donations. They really help us keep running. So important. Thank you.